Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. For those of you that have had personal or scary stories happen to you, and you would like those narrated, please email me at back to ashes the number two, at gmail.com, and I will gladly narrate your personal story right here on Back to Ashes. Also, if you enjoy what you are hearing, please show that subscribe button some love and set your notification bells to all. That way you know every time I upload. If you would like to learn how to become a member of the channel or buy me a coffee, all that information can be found down below. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Ouija Stories. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. I've recently been reading other people's Ouija stories, so I thought I would share mine. 9 out of 10, I've found a Ouija board to be useless and always ending in boredom. But this is the one experience I have never had that has been genuinely unexplainable. I'll try to make it as short as possible. A bit of a backstory. I'm the youngest of four brothers, all a year apart. At this time, I was about 9 years old and our family friend was spending the night at our place. We lived in a two-story house with a basement. At this time, our mother was single and dating a lot, so during this particular night, she was away. We saw how to make a Ouija board on this episode of a show called Mystery Hunters on YTV. It's a Canadian kids channel. So we decided it would be a fun thing to try while we had the house to ourselves. So we cut up an old box and made a Ouija board out of it. We put felt on the bottom of the triangle thing so it would slide better and it worked pretty well. We all tried putting our fingers on the triangle once and asking questions, but we never got a response. We each tried putting our fingers on the triangle and got no response. Then, me and one of my brothers asked a question to the likes of, is there a demon here? And the triangle started to move. We looked at each other, and the expression on our faces showed that it was neither of us moving the triangle. We immediately got scared and ran to the kitchen. When we got into the kitchen, we heard a crash coming from the living room. Sounded like our TV fell off the wall unit. We ran back into the living room to find that nothing was there. After this, we decided to grab the Bible, we were a religious family at the time, and read. The first words we read in unison were, God's people are doomed. Frightened by this, we turned on the TV. We saw it was Dave Chappelle, so we assumed it was going to be something funny. But then when the audio began, the first words from Dave was, and all the people died, to which the audience started laughing and then went to commercial. Freaked out by both of these things, the waterworks began and we all ran upstairs crying and screaming to my brother's bedroom. When we got up the stairs and into his bedroom, we heard footsteps that sounded exactly like ours running up the stairs after us. Immediately, I assumed it was one of my brothers or a friend late up the stairs. But when we realized we were all in the room and no one passed the door, we began to panic and held each other freaking out. Hard to say if we heard anything after this point. So this was the last that happened, for now at least. About two hours later, me and my brother, the bravest of the four, decided that this might all be in our heads and that we would go play video games on my mom's computer in her office. Diablo 2 to be exact. The door to her office had no handle, so my brother pushed the door open. Immediately after he pushed the door open, it slammed back on his arm, and all the way from the basement, we heard clear, loud laughing, 
The only way I can describe it was the sound of a witch. Echo throughout the entire house, all the way upstairs. At this point, we ran down the stairs, out of the door, into my grandmother's house, which was down the street, and waited for mom to get home. I'm not sure if she completely believed us, but this was when we were kids. I am 23 years old now, and this story sticks out as one of the only and craziest paranormal experiences I have ever had. Okay, so to start this off, before all of this, I thought Ouija boards and all that were fake. But this experience has changed my mind. Me and my friend, who we will just call Allie, decided to mess around with the Ouija board for fun. Neither of us actually owned one, so we made it out of paper. As you can imagine, it didn't look so good, but it wasn't terrible. We also somehow crumpled it up, but I don't remember how. At first, nothing was happening because both of us were laughing and spelling out fake stuff on the board. After laughing for a bit more, we actually got serious. It took a few tries, but something actually started talking to us. It was moving a bit slow at first, but got faster and faster. We both thought the other was moving it. We asked it if it could give us a name, and it went to yes, but didn't actually spell out anything. We asked it if it was human, and it said yes. We asked when they were born, and they went to four. My friend asked BC or AD, and it said BC. We both thought that was weird, but moved on. We asked if he knew who Castile was. I watched Supernatural, so it was kind of a joke. And they said yes. I asked if they knew any other angels, and they said yes. We then asked what they were again, and they spelled out angel. We asked what their name was again, and they spelled out Anoa. I asked if it watched me, and it said yes. So I asked it if it was a guardian angel, and it said no. By the way, I didn't want to go to the no all the way across the board, so we just said use the blank space as no. My mom walked in at some point, so we had to hide the board because I don't think she would like me playing with it. She probably knew something was up because we were acting super suspicious and decided to ignore it. She then said she was leaving, so we were going to be home alone. We got the board back out again and asked if it was still there, and it immediately went to yes. At this point, we both knew it was a demon, so we asked and it started spelling out Zozo. So we said goodbye, but since we're both dumb and desperate, we went back on. We said it was okay, it was a demon, and continued talking. We asked if it was actually Zozo or not and to go to D for different demon, and it went to D. We asked if Zozo was even real, and they basically said they couldn't say. We asked if demons have genders, and they said yes, and that they were a boy. After this, we started asking questions the other didn't know, like what our grandma's name was. I asked if either of us had connections to the dead people, and my friend said yes, and asked the demon which one he wanted to talk about, and they spelled out M, which is the first letter of my mom's boyfriend's name, who's dead. Allie then asked how she died. The police didn't know if it was a murder or suicide, and it spelled out M-A-N. At this time, I didn't know the story, so she explained it to me. She then asked who it was, and it spelled out the girl's boyfriend. After that, my friend wanted to get off the topic, so he did. I asked if it knew my uncle's name, which I forgot because he's been dead for a while. It was one of those things I'd see it and know it. It spelled out C, and 
I remembered his name, which did not start with a C. I asked if he knew what my grandpa's name, and it gave me a T, which was the first letter of his name. I asked if he could tell me how he died, and he spelled out cancer. I then asked if he could give me the first letter of the type, and he said L. Yeah, he died of lung cancer. I asked if he was going to kill someone in the future, and he said yes. I asked for a name, and he spelled out my friend's name. I asked if he was joking, and he said yes. We kept joking around with him, like I asked if he was Satan, and he said yes. I said, are you sure about that? And he said no. I asked if Satan had better things to do, and if he was a busy man, and he said yes. We also got him to spell out gay. When we asked why he watched me, he spelled out, why not? I also said he didn't know what the internet or school was. He couldn't give us an actual details of our future and was mostly just messing with us. We asked if he liked us and liked talking to us and he said yes. At some point, we asked if Satan created demons and he said yes. We asked him about other demons and he said he didn't like them and didn't talk to them. We asked if he was lonely, and it like literally flew across the board. It seemed like a sensitive topic. It also seemed to be practicing questions before we asked. My dad rung the doorbell, so we said goodbye, and my friend had to go. That was the end. We had been talking to him for two hours. Was it dumb of us to continue talking to him even after he admitted he was a demon? Also, the only time I really felt weird was when he spelled out man. Was it even a demon at all? He is actually really chill and was going along with whatever we said, even if he didn't know what it meant. Here's a quick edit. For all those saying my friend was messing with me, it's impossible. But honestly, she's a terrible liar. Now this is when it starts to get really weird, so strap in, this is going to be a long one. Okay, so after all of this happened, we talked to him again, like a week later. I don't really remember what happened during the conversation, but I'm pretty sure he mentioned he was now attached to me. I didn't really care though, because nothing bad happened. We talked to Anoa for a few times before something weird happened. He was acting strangely, so we asked if it was a different demon. It said yes. Cue basically the same convo that happened with the Noah originally. He admitted to being a demon and said his name was Mazam. He joked around more than Anoa and was a bit more aggressive. They both ended up being attached to me instead of my friend probably because I had more of an open energy. Anoa and Mazam didn't like each other and argued a lot over who got to talk to us. The first time we talked to Mazam, he started spelling something out, so we stopped him and asked if it was important. He said yes, so we started to write out what he spelled. It spelled out my first name and wrote sad. We both were a bit freaked out and asked if it could look up his name. We knew Mazam wasn't their real name, but just wanted something to call it by. We found a new video of it. The video is kind of cringy, but ignore that. If you don't want to watch the video, this is why it freaked us out so bad. The video mentioned being sad and Mazam spelled out sad. I get it sounds kind of stupid and could just be a coincidence, but it still freaked me the fuck out. For people thinking my friend knew about the video and just wanted to freak me out. Honestly, she believes in this stuff more than I do, and she was way more freaked out about this. She wanted to stop, but we continued anyway. Nothing really important ever happened after that. Later, we talked to them again in my living room. They were switching between who talked and started arguing. 
they suddenly stopped talking, so we left. A week later, we tried talking to them in my room, but they didn't come. Instead, we got another demon. They said that they were an incubus and gave a fake name, but I don't remember it. So, whatever. We ended up going to the living room in hopes Mazam and, and Noah were still there. They were. Long story short, Mazam and Anoa were still fighting, but managed to kill the incubus. We were kind of upset, but didn't really care. I went to Universal and asked if they went with me. They said yes, and that they enjoyed it. I asked what Mazam's favorite ride was, and he said the Hulk. He said that they were riding along with me. Now, get ready for the twist. We got on the board one day, and it didn't sound like either of them, so we asked who it was. They said their name was Dominic. We talked to him and asked if he could have Mazam or Anoa, and at one point he just left. Mazam came on the board, so we asked if he killed Dominic, and what he was. Mazam said he was an angel, and that Anoa was fighting him right now. We left so Mazam could also find him. When we came back, Mazam talked to us. He was moving really slowly, even though normally he moves really fast. We asked if Anua was okay. He said no. We asked if he was dead. He stopped for a moment and hesitantly went to yes. He said he was going to be next and we weren't going to see him again. That was the last time we heard from either of them. Dominic then talked to us. We had our doubt and didn't believe Dominic was actually an angel. Other demons claimed they were angels, so why should we believe in this one? It made him really angry. We didn't believe him. We asked if he had killed Mazam and Anoa, and he said he did. I then made a joke comparing demons to cockroaches. This is important later. My friend said to send a sign if he was an angel, and he agreed. When nothing happened, we left. Immediately afterwards, we walked outside because I had heard an owl. As soon as we stepped onto the porch, we were greeted with a dead cockroach. We continued, and there was indeed an owl in the tree. My friend looked it up, and in some cultures, owls are death omens. We believed him after that. We talked to Dominique for about a week. He was still angry at us, even though we apologized and said we believed him. We talked to him for a bit and asked about our futures. He said we have different pathways and can't say exactly what will happen. He did give some information about my friend's dad, though. We're not exactly sure if it's true because my friend doesn't even know what happened. At one point, he also told Mazam and Anoa were high-level demons. He said he was going to watch over us and kill demons that came near us. We asked a lot of questions he couldn't answer, though. I'm assuming there's just some things they can't say, considering the demons did the same thing. He talked to us a few times after that, but not for long because he hates us. Soon after that, when we tried to talk to Dominique, some rude-ass demon came in instead. Whenever we asked for a name, he said DP. He wasn't answering any of our questions. At one point, he spelled out Omen. Dominique came on for a minute and just left. Like I said, he hated us. We went for a walk later and saw a dead bird whose guts were ripped out. Do you think the dead duck is related to the demon? Side note, we weren't used to the Ouija board in a while because whenever we come on, it's the DP demon and he's annoying. Also, might be unrelated but odd story. I was rummaging around on my desk and a nickel fell and went halfway under the closet door. I looked for a second and considered picking it up, but decided I'll do it later. I actually forgot about it. A few hours later, 
I was on the phone with my friend and was rummaging around my desk again, and a nickel fell once more. I thought, huh, that's weird. Didn't that just happen? And looked for the original nickel I dropped and couldn't find it. So basically, the nickel suddenly reappeared on my desk and it dropped again. I don't think anyone else could have picked it up because, one, no one's going into my room, and two, it was almost under my closet. And there is no way someone could have just noticed it. This happened after the whole Dominic thing. My mom was born in 1950. She went to college in Rexburg, Idaho. For any who aren't familiar, it's a religious college. She was with some friends one night at a house. There was probably about 15 people there. Nobody was drinking or using hard drugs. They just had dinner and were hanging out, playing games. Somebody brought out a Ouija board. And since this was years and years and years ago, nobody really knew as much about them as we do today. So a lot of people didn't know that they should have stayed away from this thing. My mom said she didn't participate, but she sat next to them and watched. I have to say, my mom told me this story many times, and her details never changed. And she is not one of those people to make things up. So I have no reason to believe this was not 100% true. So my mom's watching about 8 of the 15 people using the Ouija board. They're asking lots of questions and it's getting moved around. But with so many people, she didn't know if someone was moving it or if it was the real deal. There was a girl that my mom didn't know very well who was there. And she was really getting into the Ouija board. They knew there was certain kinds of questions that probably they shouldn't have asked. But this girl started asking really specific ones. They started out pretty innocent, as innocent as the Ouija board can be. And the girls started asking questions about demons and wanting to see dead people and know the future. These were a bunch of religious people, so they were starting to get really freaked out and wanted to stop. The girl didn't want to stop and ask a couple of other questions, which at this point I can't recall what they were. But she refused to stop. They finally all convinced her they needed to right before they were able to say goodbye. She didn't ask a question. She said, and this is the part I won't ever forget, I want to see you. Before they could say goodbye, the planchette moved to yes. Everybody started losing it. They said goodbye and put the Ouija board away and started playing charades to kind of lighten the mood. While the games were being played, the girl just happened to be sitting closest to the door. My mom said she was sitting on the other side of the room where she was facing the door, so she would be face to face with this girl, but about 10 feet away. Someone knocked on the door, and since nobody else was being expected, they all kind of froze, I think. They were still a little freaked out by what had happened, especially the fact that the girl had gone really crazy and asked a bunch of scary questions. So, after about 30 seconds of pushing, this girl gets up and goes to the door. She opens it, and for some reason, the porch light is out. It hadn't been out earlier. My mom said from there she could see it looked like a dark shadow standing right outside the door on the porch. It was just a shadow to her. There was no facial features, and there were no clothing features. It just looked like a big black thing in the shape of a person standing there. Only a few people were facing the door, so most people have their back to it and didn't see what happened. Next thing my mom knows, the girl falls to the ground and passes out. Everybody's focused on her, and nobody noticed that the shadow had disappeared. 
They called an ambulance, but the girl didn't make it. She had a heart attack, at least. That's what they told us. They were given information that the girl's heart just stopped. My mom never had any other experiences or saw anybody else play with that board. I've also never touched a Ouija board. I don't believe for a second anything good can come from one. The demon speaking through it may seem kind and nice, but they want you off of your guard. Their end goal is to possess you. Some can do it quickly, others it takes them time to wear you down. But just by playing the game, you're allowed them to speak through you and you open up yourself to them. The moral of the story? Don't ever play with the Ouija board. And if someone pulls one out, leave the house. This is a story from my life that I've told people, especially teenagers, to warn them to never use the Ouija board. It's long, but I hope it serves the purpose here. When I was a senior in high school in 1989, my brother came home from college on spring break and told stories about him and some friends using the Ouija board. I had done some things to freak them out, so we dug out the one we had in our attic. I don't know why we had it or where we got it from. He showed me what they had done, but nothing happened with us. I brought it to a friend's house, and we tried it out a few times over the course of a few evenings, and then about the third or fourth time, it really started to pick up in its responses. We had been starting knocking three times in the corner of the board and saying something like, come spirit, or something to that effect. Anyway, the marker started to really move around the board and spell things out. I always told people that it was either our subconsciousness or a spirit moving it abroad. Because I was certain neither of us was moving it intentionally. With a light touch of a few fingers from each of our hands, it would be just to move to spell things like its own personality. We would ask it all sorts of usual questions, test questions, and curiosity ones. One day, though, I wasn't a fan of it. My friend asked the board in which years we would all die. It spelled out something like 2040 or 40-ish for my friend. I actually don't remember the number, just something like far in the future. And 1990 for me, which was the coming year. I asked, does that mean I'm going to die in 1990? And my friend in 20 blah blah blah? No, it said. Then I ask again, this time switching the years around between us. Yes, it said. We asked the spirit about itself. It said it died the year my friend's father was born and said its name was Stephen Crane. We kind of laughed at that part. Of course, I looked up some dates about the author after that, and things didn't seem to jive. I thought, could be another person with that name, and just moved on. Anyway, we started to invite friends over to watch, who were all entirely skeptical. By the end of the evening, each person by the end of the evening, every single one was freaked out. More and more friends would come each night until we started getting a huge group of people. The board would answer plenty of the test questions wrong. But then, for example, while everyone's reacting to the wrong answer and half paying attention, it spelled out, sorry. And another time, for example, in a lull between activity, while people were distracting and chatting, it moved back to S, then kept circling around to H, 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 until it came to a stop there. Nothing for about two minutes. The entire room of people completely silent. Then, 
it slowly moved to O.K. It said a bad spirit had passed through the room. Everyone freaks out, of course. I didn't like this one friend, and every time he even entered the room when we had these gatherings, the marker would twist and move to the opposite side of the board. And other things like that happened. Again, it had its own personality. I remember a few times driving home alone with that thing in the back seat of my car, terrified with my heart pounding. One time I asked it, where will I go to college? It spelled out one of the schools I was applying to, and then 37. I asked if I was going to that school and get a 3.7 GPA the first semester, and it said yes. I was sure all along that my friend wasn't moving it intentionally, but I had proof because one day he was really disturbed and frustrated with his girlfriend, a friend of mine. He had suspected she was cheating on him, and he asked the board a question about her, while using it with a friend, of course, and it told him to turn on the TV. The video for the song what You Don't Know Might Hurt You by Expose was playing on MTV. I remember he really took that to heart, and it affected his trust in their relationship. So, I always knew he wasn't just playing around with the board, and that was a sort of hard proof of it. We started to actually use the board with our friends, but it only worked when one of us two used it with someone. We asked the spirit why that was and it responded that the spirit was inside my friend and that I was the owner of the board. Freaky stuff thinking back on it now but as an 18 year old you think differently. Anyway the enthusiasm started to peter out after a few moments maybe near the end of the summer and I don't know what happened to the Ouija board. I did end up going to that college that the board mentioned, but it didn't really catch my attention. When I got home for my first semester, after 1990 had just begun, I got my grades. I got a 3.7. I don't remember if I made the connection or not, but I certainly did when the next thing happened. Around the same week or so, maybe even around the same day, I got the annual catalog that my college sends out with articles and updates and whatnot. I opened it up, but there in front of me was a whole article about Stephen Crane. He had gone to my college for a while, and I never had any idea of it. I remember having chills. Ten years later, I was buying a condo and a lot of serendipitous things, good things, were happening around the purchase, that event with the Ouija board was so daylight with me that I decided to do a good search to find out if Stephen Crane had lived in the condo that I was buying. I didn't feel anything, and the condo was great, but I had found something. I would indefinitely have pulled out the P and S. Finally, the sad part is that later in 1990, after returning to college classes after Thanksgiving break, my friend, one of my best friends, died suddenly and unexpectedly from a heart problem. I don't know when I made the connection with the board, because by then it was over a year later, but at the same point I did, and when I started to put the whole storyline together, it sank in even more about how creepy and dark this whole thing is. I am happy in life, very blessed. I did go through a form of spiritual growth some years ago where this darkness was left behind. And this story of my past doesn't haunt me. I share it in the hope that it's helpful for others. But I would never touch a Ouija board again and would strongly advise against anyone using one. To this day, I am still positive that it was not our conscious action at work, but either of our subconsciousness or truly a spirit. So whichever of those you might believe it is, 
Nothing good comes from playing around with either of them. At the minimum, negligence can open up a path for psychological and emotional problems. And at worst, relating with a spirit can let in a darkness and fear beyond your understanding or strength that can tent your life and affect you for time to come. I just wanted to add a couple more things here. After reflecting on my story, I wanted to add more context for the reason for posting it and the choice of the title. I mentioned a few times that I thought the source of the board's movements was either subconsciousness or spiritual paranormal. As a person of religious faith with a science and engineering background, I still do think that it was one of the other, or a mixture of both. I have a great respect for both the human sciences and human spiritual wisdom, and both of them have always had guidance in the form of professional individuals and or community experience for a reason. Psychology and spirituality can be very deep and heavy, so they can be quite dangerous and harmful if practiced without experienced guidance. The problem with the Ouija board is that it is mass-produced and marketed as an innocent game for kids age 8 plus, which is not only an insult to both science professionals and human wisdom traditions, but also creates the dangerous situations of people playing with their psych when they are not equipped to process the consequences. Under the branding of Innocent Game, Ouija boards make it into the homes and hands of unprepared, unguided people, causing psychological and spiritual damage. I think it's reckless and negligent on the part of the manufacturers, but I don't so much blame the Ouija board as I do them. So, I hope my story presents one example in all of that context, and that it is why I say, don't use it. Okay, so before I begin, I'd like to explain that this story is quite controversial. Some people don't believe me, and some do. I don't ask that you believe me. I just tell the story to mainly make people aware that Ouija boards should be taken very seriously. Make sure you look up proper procedures and how to use it before playing around with one. So, I'd like to begin that this story I've tried to forget, and I cannot remember every single detail. I can't remember every one of the questions we asked and the answers we received. I can remember a few, but not a hundred percent. I can't remember what happened with me. And this story is my brother Nick, my sister-in-law Brittany, her friend Ashley, and my girlfriend at the time, Katie. And with that, let's begin. I'm going to take you back to the summer of 2010. This year, I had a rush of getting into the paranormal. The fact that ghosts and demons are real fascinating to me and would make my adrenaline pump when I would encounter such things. Well, this particular night, my sister-in-law had asked me if I had ever taken part in a Ouija board, and at that time, I had no clue what that even was, so she knew, obviously, I never had. So, she began explaining what Ouija boards are, how they work and such. Then she asked me if I would like to experience it for myself. Of course, just at the thought, my heart had skipped a beat. So we decided that we would do it and had to find a place to do it. Her parents wouldn't let us do it at their house. My brother and her were only dating at that time, let alone even around the house. So me and my brother decided, fuck it. I know mom and dad won't let us do it inside, but outside on the porch in the garage shouldn't be a big thing, right? So we go down to my parents' house and we start setting up shop on the back porch. Got a candle, matches, pen and paper. Grab some chairs around a table and set ourselves around it. 
Just as we were starting, my heart started pumping so fast and hard, I was really nervous. Was this really going to work, I wondered. So we all put our hands over the Ouija, and Brittany had one hand over it so she could write with the other, and we started by asking if there are any friendly spirits around us that would like to communicate with us. The Ouija board moved to no, and I started freaking out. I'm only barely touching this fucking thing. I mean, my fingers are pretty much hovering over it with a paperclip, thin gap away from the planchette. Triangular shaped piece, usually with a small glass circle in the center, used to cast over letters and such to communicate with people. I asked if anybody was moving it and told them to stop fucking with me. I ain't got time for this bullshit. And everyone was saying, no, we're not playing around with you. We want this all to work, just as bad as you are. And Brittany asked Nick to be serious. Are you playing around? And to stop it. So he said he was it, and he wanted it to work too. So then Brittany's voice became firm, and she stated that only benevolent entities are welcome here, and any violent entities were not welcome to speak with us, and that they could go ahead and leave, or we'll just end the session. So we wait a few minutes, all place our hands over the planchette again, and Brittany states again, are there any spirits here with us tonight that would like to communicate with us? The planchette slowly moved to yes. So, sure, maybe an entity was lying to us. Who knows, right? But we decide to keep going, trying to communicate with the spirit. Brittany asks, is there anyone in particular here that you would like to speak with? The board this time pretty swiftly moved to yes and back to the center. Now, usually you are the ones that would push the planchette back to the center, but this spirit just seemed to guide it the whole entire time we were communicating with it. Brittany begins to ask it, who would it like to communicate with? The board slowly spelt out Ashley's name. Now, Ashley began getting nervous, asking, why me? Why does it want to start with me? She seemed to be getting nervous and shit. I would too if it had specified wanting to communicate with me first. So Brittany tells Ashley to ask it something. That this could be a relative or could be a lying demon. She told her to ask a question that only she would know and no one else did. And it could not be an easy answer. And Ashley asked what year the spirit had died if it had even ever lived. I can't remember the year it spilled out, but I do remember her exclaiming that that was the year her mother had died, and she began getting frantic and sad, but she was interested. So Brittany told her to ask questions only her mother would know. I can't remember all of these, but Ashley asked personal questions only her mother would know. Not even any of us would have known, and things started getting really creepy. So here's Ashley becoming very emotional, believing she is really speaking with her mother at one point. One of us would take our finger off and see if it would go with just three of us, then two of us, then just Ashley herself. And the planchette was still slightly moving around with just Ashley hovering two fingers above the piece. Whoever it was had a strong connection with her. I remember the spirit spilling out how thankful it was Ashley found my sister-in-law that her mother never left her side and was just happy she had a real friend in her life that truly cared for her daughter. After all this had happened, and I mean, we spent a good time, over an hour, maybe even more than two hours, communicating for Ashley. And just like that, Ashley felt she had asked enough we asked that her mother's spirit stay with us and ask if there was any other friendly spirits around that would like to communicate with us, and if so, would stay and watch over us. Well, the board went to yes and no. We asked what it meant, and it slowly spelled out evil and good, and that they, the good, fought evil away. 
We thanked her mother and the other spirits for protecting us and asked her mother if she would communicate with us with the others. The board went to yes, so we all began taking turns. My brother, then Katie, just asking random questions. My brother being stupid and asking how he would die, and I forget what the board said. I think it had said age or something, assuming it was saying old age, and he said that that shit is lame. And the girls all gave him shit, because I guess you're not supposed to ask questions like that. There's some things you shouldn't ask because you shouldn't know. You should just let them play out. Well, it gets to my turn, and I couldn't really think of much. I knew I was thinking around, asking if it was going to die young like my brother had asked, just to piss off the girls. But to be honest, when I was younger, I never thought I was going to make it past 18. I just felt like I was here for a good time, not a long time. Still kind of feel that way, but obviously, I made it past 18. Well, actually, I hardly did. Anyway, I asked it if my grandfather was okay, and if he made it to heaven. And I got a yes, and frowned as a response. Then, I asked it if I was ever going to be a successful football player, that year, I had just received offers to go play for the Miami Hurricanes and Ole Miss, and I wanted to know if I could go pro. The board said yes. I got excited and then asked the board which one to take, and it spelled out M-I-S-S. -S. I got excited because that was the school that I wanted to go to, but I also felt like maybe these were easy answers. Maybe it can read what I want, and that's how it's answering now. I don't know. Who knows if we were still communicating with Ashley's mom? So I asked it if I could make it to Ole Miss. The board said no. I got hurt. That shit fucked me up. I asked it why. It slowly spelt out, accident. I then asked, what accident? Am I going to get hurt? It said yes. Now, everybody was getting really nervous, but I was getting pissed. And Brittany reminded me that I was asking questions that you should never be asking. But now I was invested. Fuck it. I wanted to know. It slowly spelt out, car and death. Well, at this point, Brittany had had enough. I was asking questions I shouldn't be, so had my brother. She didn't like the feeling she was receiving anymore from the energy in that room, and she decided to begin ending the session. Well, that's just what she did. Well, now we shortly just get to why. I tell the story to warn people about Ouija's. A year and a half later, so 2011 in my junior I got a job at a pizza place delivering pizzas after football season to help my parents pay out some bills, like my cell phone, gas and such, and helping them out if they needed it. Well, one night, a night that I can't even remember, I only remember what I was told. I got into a really bad car accident while at work one night. Apparently, from what eyewitnesses had told police, what the doctors and police told me the next morning when I finally gained consciousness at around 7 to 8 a.m. I was coming around a corner on US-1. It's an old highway down here in Florida. With a bit of traffic following me on the other end was two cars parked side by side in the median. One of the vehicle, well, the one I hit, was parked in the median, but majority out on the road of the highway. So, here came me in a bunch of traffic with nowhere to go. I slammed into this lady's back end of her trailblazer at about 75 miles per hour. I don't wear seatbelts, so I bounced the fuck around inside, hitting my windshield and blowing out my driver window with my face. And I had hit her so hard that our cars bounced apart and my vehicle almost went off the edge into the water. A big river next to the highway. 
The front end of my vehicle was crushed all the way to my windshield. Sorry I said I'd keep this part short. I got a grade 3 concussion, a contusion on my forehead the size of a cantaloupe, maybe bigger. Tore my meniscus, broke my leg, and such. I stayed in the ICU for two weeks. Didn't get to go back to school that year. I was in the hospital, homebound because I got so messed up I could barely walk from a torn muscles and fractures in my leg. I was having seizures and doctors were afraid of me bumping my head, saying I could easily die, so I stayed in a wheelchair for a few months at home. So yeah, I never got to play football again, lost all my scholarships, and couldn't help but think, for the love of fucking God... Did this happen to me because I had asked this Ouija board about it and it had told me all of this would happen? If I never did ask, what would have happened? Long story short, either don't fuck around with Ouija's or be very careful out there if you do. All right, this is going to be long, but I'll try to be in-depth as I possibly can and try to recount everything I've been told. But yeah, if anyone has any ideas or answers, please feel free to tell me. Just before I do start, I'd like to add that I've been heavily involved with paranormal experiences. I've seen spirits walking around. I know when some are present. I do use a pendulum, but a lot of the time I take precaution and make sure to cleanse and protect myself. So, outside of my town, there is an old abandoned orphanage and a memorial for all the children that were abused there and died. And five of us decided it would be a great idea to go out there and explore it. We scoped the place out during the day to find things to get into. And then came back at night at around 11 to 11.30 p.m. We parked a few hundred meters down the road from it, out of sight just in case of the police, and we started walking. We got closer to the gate before one of my friends, C.M., who is like the biggest skeptic adrenaline junkie alive, stops dead in his tracks, turns around, and starts sprinting telling us that he saw someone in front of him. We all started running back towards the car. The entire time, there's rustling from the bushes, like something was following us. We get in the car. I turn around and just see three figures, clear as day, standing behind the car watching us drive away. Two girls and one boy between the ages of 13 and 16. So we decided to hell with that. Let's go up to the witch's grave. In hindsight, and awful idea, but we were all excited to go out and explore. I had my pendulum with us, and on the way up was communicating with a spirit that decided to follow us from the orphanage. Her name was Faith, and she was absolutely lovely. Around this time, I started getting a massive headache, and my eyes were watering, but I didn't think anything of it. I started getting really tired and disassociated and fell asleep, or at least I thought I went to sleep. I woke up, and it seemed like only five minutes passed. We just reached the town with the grave, and one of the guys sitting beside me, Jay, was saying how I was staring out the window the entire time, going into a burst of laughter. I sounded different, and my laugh was different. Anyway, we pull up to the witch's grave, and Jay swears that we saw someone walk past the grave. We made a Ouija board and wanted to communicate with spirits with it. I didn't want to get out of the car, and Jay didn't either. So we sat in the car listening to music while the rest, CM, CB, and D, sat in front of the grave messing with that board. Music started doing all funky and weird things. The radio was acting up in prior. Everything was working perfectly. 
About 15 minutes passed, and Jay decides to get out to see how they're doing. Comes back in, followed by everyone else. Seeming a little freaked out, I ask what was wrong, and CM says that Jay was staring behind CM and said, He's right behind you. I turned around and went back to the car. Jay had no memory of this, but the rest of the guys backed CM up. The music stopped working, and we started driving back down the mountain. It got incredibly cold, even with the heater on. I started getting a massive headache behind my head and back of ears, which is apparently a sign of spiritual attachment. CB is driving D in the passenger seat, and CM was by the right window. Jay was in the middle, and I was on the left window seat. Jay started tearing up a little bit and went silent before he just started laughing. Turned to me very slowly with the biggest grin on his face and just stared. I asked him what he was doing, and he never responded. A few minutes later, he was himself again. CB, a few minutes later, stared spacing out really badly. We were using the pendulum consulting and asking if there was any possible harm coming our way, in which it violently answered yes. We all yelled for CB to pull over. He was refusing, but eventually did. CM and CB swapped seats. I blacked out from here. From here on out, this is the guys filling me in on what happened. It was an entire hour. CM joked and said that they should see the Ouija board and see what it wants. Upon that, CB replied with, in the most polite and formal tone, Yes, we should. Keep in mind, that's also the only thing he said the entire time. And I agreed with him, despite being very against wanting to use the board again. Apparently, CM, J, and D all decided it would be the best option to get some sage and burn it to try and get rid of whatever was attached to it. I am the only one who owns sage, keep that in mind. And upon hearing the mention of it, they said I burst out crying, apologizing and begging for them to not get it saying that. I didn't want to leave. Jay was freaking out, so him and D swapped seats. D's family is a line of white witches, so apparently he tried to bless both CB and himself, in which my response to that was violently pushing him off, thrashing about, repeatedly saying no, and very coldly and calmly saying, I don't like you. D is like one of my best mates. I have no hatred against him at all. J and ZM do get the sage. Apparently I let them in, flat out refused to touch the sage, stood very far away from it. Got in the car and headed towards the riverbank. CB was very blind but very slow to follow. They described him to be a zombie, and apparently I was resisting hesitating, crying, and refused to follow them. So they practically dragged me along. As soon as the sage was lit, they told me that I bolted, got as far away from it as possible, trying to jump over the edge into the river. J and CM had to grab me and forcibly hold me and drag me in place. They said I was crying violently and saying sorry and don't do this, don't do this, over and over. I wake up. I was on the ground, still being held, with D waving the sage around to me. CB checked his phone, and the first thing he said was, it was only 1 a.m. two minutes ago. I felt confused and disoriented and tired. So the best course of action for all of us was to go home and sleep it off. I stayed with CM and J for the night. I woke up the next day feeling like I had drank two bottles of wine and went home. I still felt awful, so I went home. The headache behind my ears was still there. 
I felt cold despite having no fever. It was a warm day and night. I was wearing a hoodie. I was hearing knocking noises, footsteps outside of the door. I had bad heart pain. I was throwing up and my nose was bleeding very badly. My nose has never bled. JNCM messaged me saying that something was wrong. Their mom was concerned about me and that they were coming to get me. So I went with them back to their place. Explained to Jay's mom and dad what happened. Jay's dad, who doesn't really believe in this kind of stuff, but both of them have had paranormal experiences before, told me to get outside and stand on the grass barefoot to ground myself. That kind of worked. CM and I also turned around to stare at the gate because we both heard and saw something and Jay's mom later confirmed and said she saw something too. Ever since then, I see and hear things a hundred times more than what I used to. But just in case, I now carry Obsidian with me. And that, dear listeners, brings it close to these true Ouija stories. Before I go any further, I would like to take a moment and give a very special shout out to the elite members of Back to Ashes. Nat Davies, Stephanie McLaren, Tammy Slayton, Mrs. Innerscare, Chrissy Elias, Sugared Spite, Tina Mead, Cindy, Amy Klimko, Anita V, Dova Khaleesi, Ida Smith, Les Crispin, Samantha Place, Patty Sneeze, Denise S, Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all so much for your continued support of Back to Ashes, because if there wasn't you, there wouldn't be a me or this channel. Thank you. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. In the meantime, however, please take care of yourselves and stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.